much, uh, Dr. Rahul, and thank you, Dr. Bansi. Uh, you have always uh, shown so, uh, tremendous dynamism in all the conferences of India, and I really admire you for that. Uh, today, we've just heard a talk on testosterone and men, and now we are changing the gears to women. And everyone talks of menopause, but there are so many years before menopause that women have a lot of issues and a lot of challenges. That is known as the midlife of a woman. And let us see, it is known as the perimenopause. The perimenopause marks the beginning of the menopause transition, starting with the menstrual irregularity of more than seven days between consecutive cycles and leading up to the last menstrual period and continuing for 12 months after that. Whereas the menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation and is said to have occurred when 12 months have passed since the last menstrual cycle. Why should we worry about the midlife health? Why should we worry about perimenopause? As you can see from this very elegant picture, you see many perimenopause starts between the age of 35 to 45. Before that, a woman has a normal productive and a reproductive life. It is known as the premenopause, where the estrogen levels are kind of raised and steady. And once they have their last regular period, and then the periods become irregular, which happens somewhere between 35 and 45, you will see that the estrogen levels go down. They not only go down, but they also fluctuate tremendously. They go up, maybe even higher than their previous level. So there, there are peaks, there are troughs. And it is this phase that is very turbulent for women before they reach menopause, known as the perimenopause or the midlife. And why is this important? Because you see from 35 to 45, with a life expectancy of 67 to 70 years, the majority of a woman's life is spent in the perimenopause and menopause. And therefore, they need to have a good quality of life. And we are looking today of good quality of life in a woman during the perimenopause when they have a lot of issues. So you see, how do, long does it last? There, is, there are some women who have very early perimenopause where there are only changes in experiences. They're very confident before this and they suddenly lose their confidence for reasons that cannot be explained. And some women have a very late perimenopause, which is very close to their cessation of their menstrual cycle. A lot of patients, women are in between. And this period, could be anywhere between two to eight years. So it is a long time that women suffer. It is also the time when all the children have moved out of the home or they have moved out and they have come back possibly because of role conflict over there. It is also a time when they have finished all their basic reproductive life and look and nurturing their children and they have been cut off from social life because of this and they want to rejoin so this is a time to pre-plan of where one intends to be at what age let us understand the perimenopause scientifically you will see here that there is a num decrease of the follicles in the ovaries which actually decreases the inhibit levels and there you can see some dominant follicles making more estrogen, but really not suppressing the FSH. So the FSH is raised, there are dominant uh, um, follicles, and you can get increased estrogen at this time. But really speaking, if you look at this figure, the estrogen levels are declining. But in the very early perimenopause, the levels actually increase beyond what it was in the past. But it doesn't increase steadily or decrease steadily. It fluctuates. And just like glycemic variability in diabetes, this estrogen variability is the one that creates all the problems and gives rise to all the symptoms in the midlife. But look at progesterone. Progesterone levels are lower than the premenopause and they steadily go down to reach menopause when both the hormones actually go down to their lowest level. 
And it is because of these fluctuations in the estrogens and declining progesterone that women have problems. And the problems are not related to any sim system and therefore they themselves don't understand what is happening. They say they can't sleep, they are too anxious, they have night sweats, they have uh, a heavy flow of menstruation, they, may, they can get headache, they can have infertility. Basically, they can't cope. They they don't seem to cope and they get tired very easily. They also may have nausea and they gain weight, although they are eating the same and exercising the same as before. So when do they know that women have started perimenopause? A lot of them do have regular cycles, but they also have all these issues. So if there are nine symptoms here, if they have any of the three out of these nine, they could be starting perimenopause. So the periods can get heavier, they can have longer flow duration, they can have shorter menstrual cycles of less than 25 days, they may have swollen or lumpy breasts, they might get up in the night and have difficulty sleeping back again. So sleep problems, this is the time the sleep problems start. And many a time a woman comes to you asking for a pill to induce sleep. So it, it could be the starting of the midlife. They can get increased cramps and then we should not mistake them if they have type 2 diabetes for a neuropathy. So you have to distinguish that. They have onset of night sweats and we will see why they get that particular around the flow. They might have increased migraine headaches, increased premenstrual mood swings, and they can have a weight gain, although they may exercise or eat less. So this is a questionnaire that will help them to understand. And this was a Melbourne random sample where they had the percentage of experiencing the various symptoms. And you can see here that in late menopause, all these symptoms, especially the aches and pains, the hot flushes, the night sweats increase compared to the early perimenopause and there are various, so one third, you see the anywhere uh, samples between 30 to 50% um, is experienced by these women. And in spite of that, 84% of the women say that the symptoms interfere with their lives. 12% say they interfere a great deal and are debilitating. And the most common symptoms of menopause for women are hot flashes. 50% of the women have hot flashes. 42% of them have night sweats. And 38% of them have vaginal dryness. These are the common symptoms that are seen in women. And 42% say they've never discussed menopause with a healthcare provider because only one in five women received a referral to a menopause specialist. You see, there are other issues that in the various systems, mm -hmm. in the reproductive, vasomotor, genitourinary, psychosomatic, uh, metabolic, cardiovascular, and the musculoskeletal system, which can disturb the quality of life. The most common symptom is the hot flush. And the hot flush or the hot flash whatever you may call it, is a sudden wave of heat with sweating spreading over the body, particularly in the upper body and face, which may last for a minute or so. It increases the skin temperature because vasodilatation increases systolic and the diastolic blood pressure and also the heart rate. So the women may also complain of palpitations. Who are the women who get it? The women who have a very narrow thermoregulatory zone of the hypothalamus, which is dependent on the estrogen, since it has a large amount of the estrogen receptors and has become dysfunctional, are the ones who get a lot of vasomotor symptoms. Out of 100, at least 30%, 30 to 50% of the women uh, get hot flushes and they get it pretty early in the perimenopause, which actually continue to last even beyond, perimen even beyond the menopause. As the estrogen level drops, there are other hormones that increase in the brain. There are other neurotransmitters like the brain norepinephrine, the serotonin, and also the cortisol and HCTH increase. And the rise of these neurotransmitters, especially the norepinephrine sets the stage for the night sweats. 
and basically this is induced by a rapid fluctuation of the estrogen levels so it is not there all the time a woman can get it maybe just once in a day or some of them even get it 10 times in a day and it is basically the peak and the trough of estrogen that induces it sleep disturbances are directly related to the decrease of the estrogen level you see these women actually go to sleep but they wake up because of the night sweats and because of the palpitations and the hot flashes in the night and then they cannot go back to sleep they are awakened easily by the pain by sound or by bodily urges and some of them also get a uh, sleep disordered breathing due to pharyngeal obstruction which is more common associated with obesity increased bmi and markedly declining estrogen and progesterone level a few women snore a lot and sometimes that can lead to obstructive sleep apnea so we have to be vigilant about this studies show that estrogen plays a role in normal cognitive function estrogen decreases during perimenopause and that can lead not only to the flushing and mood changes but in some studies even mild cognitive changes you can just hear some women tell you in the consulting room that you know i was so confident before this and now i'm just forgetting something i don't even realize whether i've closed the tap or i have taken my vitamin so you see a mild memory loss sets in and also a verbal fluency impairment so they tell you that i used to talk very rapidly and continuously and now when i talk on the phone that you know i have to stop and some of them also have slowed psychomotor speech so this actually has a lot of impact in working women and therefore we need to recognize it pretty early and not neglect the symptoms that the women tell us midlife transition is also a very complex social and a cultural affair besides being a hormonal event you will see that at this stage especially in people in women who are working they have a lot of psych anxiety they have depression the risk of depression is two and a half times higher because of the hormonal fluctuation and if they have had a hysterectomy as known as a surgical menopause then the risk of depression is much higher but they also have a lot of mood swings and other psychosocial problems sexual dysfunction is also experienced by women we always talk of sexual dysfunction in men and you've heard in the last session they were talking of erectile dysfunction etc but even women have uh, problems in their midlife so they may experience a severe dyspareunia because of hypertonic and dyssynergia flow muscles they may lose interest in sex they may have an inability to relax or they might have arousal difficulties or inability to reach orgasm but the frequency of sexual activity does not seem to change so we have to worry about this and many a times the patients need treatment for sexual dysfunction and why do they get this peronia because if you can see the picture on the right at pre menopause you will see multiple rugae good secretion lot of mucus there in but when the person when the woman reaches post menopause you'll see all those rugae have disappeared and it the wall of the vagina has thin, thinned out giving rise to severe uh the dyspareunia and sexual dysfunction but estrogen receptors are not only present in the vagina but they are also present in the bladder and in the urethra and the pelvic floor musculature and besides sexual dysfunction or genito urinary complaints these patients now start getting incontinence you will hear women saying that you know i used to get a sound sleep in the night before this but now i have to get up to go to the restroom and not only that they may suffer from true incontinence and frequency of urination and multiple urinary tract infections so what should they do 
as much as possible, this is a physiological phenomenon. Unless they have any disease like diabetes and other comorbidities, when they can have marked changes and marked severe symptoms, and then you need to look at everything as a whole. But otherwise, this physiological condition passes off. But at that time, when women have problems, they have to try and exercise. As the previous speaker just said, lifestyle is the key. Lifestyle modification for all chronic diseases, for normal healthy living is very important for those women who sport, stop smoking, those who take alcohol, as reduce as much as possible, exercise most of the days, identify any triggers that may cause all, relaxation techniques and mindful living is very important, address the mood changes and also reduce weight, maintain the BMI, go for regular checkups, do a mammogram, the pap smears, the blood, look at the blood pressure, the lipids and also the take an ECG and other tests that are part of the medical checkup to rule out other problems in women. When do we start treatment? You see, when the patient has vasomotor symptoms, when they have loss of libido and vaginal dryness, and for the chronic disease like osteoporosis, we need to start menopause replacement therapy. In perimenopausal women, the treatment options are sequential estrogen plus progesterone, or you can give combined oral contraceptive, if not contraindicated, or estrogen plus with an orgestrol, which is intrauterine. For postmenopausal, with an intact uterus, you give a combined uh, transdermal patch or a transdermal estrogen plus oral progesterone or an oral estrogen or oral progesterone or now tibolone. And at any stage post hysterectomy, we need to give transdermal estrogen or oral estrogen or tibolone. Now, menopausal hormone treatment is given and the decision is done if a if a woman has an intact uterus or it is post hysterectomy. If the woman has an intact uterus, then you need to give a combined pill of estrogen and progesterone. But if the person, woman has had an hysterectomy, then only estrogen is enough. If you give a, a woman with an intact uterus only estrogen, then that can cause hyperplasia of the uterus and can lead to endometriosis or uterine cancer. And this is very, very important to... Now there are other, this, this, these are all, I will not go into detail. You see the oral estrogen regime, you can see the dose, you see various estrogen preparations. There are transdermal preparations, there are subdermal implants, there are vaginal creams. It depends on what on what the woman needs and the comfort of the healthcare practitioner. So both have to be taken in a discussion and, and we have to decide what exactly to give the patient. Now, estrogen consequence deficiency also has other late complications. And these complications can start even in midlife. So you can, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, all producing a reduced quality of life. So look at this. The biggest culprit for osteoporosis is the accelerated bone loss that happens during menopause somewhere between 70 to 80. And you see the graph, the lower graph at menopause or starting even in perimenopause, the lowered estrogen levels correspond to the to the accelerated bone loss that happens in women. Compared to the men, where you see the upper graph, it is more gradual, but their bone mass at all times is much more than the women. And it is very important that if you look at the picture on the left, these exercises are not to be done by women and we have to inform them to exercise caution about this. And how do we treat this? You see, this is a picture 
uh, graph of a um, study of Southern California Health Management Organization where more than 80,000 women were seen, but they all were beyond the age of 60, followed up for six years. And you will see both were given HRT. In those women who stopped HRT after five years, you see the risk of osteoporosis increase. And therefore, the Endocrine Society 2019 has made it mandatory or recommend that MHT is to be given for the prevention of all types of fractures in post menopausal women at high risk of fracture and following characteristic they have to be given when they are under the age of 60 or less than 10 years post menopause in those where bisphosphonates and denisumabs are not appropriate and they have bothersome vasomotor symptoms and no other contra contraindications what about cardiovascular system does decrease estrogen give rise to increase mortality, cardiovascular mortality, we know the protective function of estrogen and uh, has actually produced delay in the presentation of CVD in women compared to men. But when there is less estrogen, this is brought forward and the risk of cardiovascular disease is very high in, in women who have low estrogen. And this can start in the perimenopause and go on to the menopause. And therefore, when we want to decide to give a menopause hormonal therapy, we have to choose as to when to give this. The benefits of exogenous estrogens are seen when the woman is younger, less than 60 years of age, the younger, the better. But once the woman is older, there are no benefits. In fact, it can cause harm. And this was the ELITE study showing us in 643 women, where they divided these women into two cohorts, where they gave HRT to women less than six years and the second cohort more than 10 years. And what did they find? That in women in less than 10 years, uh, menopause, HRT, it could modify the carotid intima medial thickness, suggesting that it does help women if it is given at the right time. So the timing should be right. If it is started in the perimenopausal or early postmenopausal period, less than 10 years, then it is cardioprotective. If the um, menopause hormone therapy is begun later after 10 years of menopause, then the risk of cardiovascular mortality goes up. And therefore the timing hypothesis is very important. This has been corroborated in the Women's Health Initiative where they gave estrogen and you see there's a reduction of, of coronary heart disease and also of breast cancer in women who are younger. It helped them. And here, this is also a study done by Rosenberg in presented in 2020 as to what kind of menopause hormone therapy should be given. If you give a combined therapy of estrogen and progesterone, then it doesn't benefit much for the woman. There's only a decrease in fractures and death from any cause and also diabetes. But if you give estrogen alone, then coronary heart disease decreases, breast cancer decreases, colorectal cancer, all cancers, all fractures, death from any cause and diabetes. So estrogen alone is a better therapy. And uh, this is a simple slide to show you that when women come to us during the perimenopause, uh, somewhere around the age of 35 and 45, we need to take a good history, personal and family history. We need to discuss their lifestyle issues, smoking, alcohol, whether they are doing any physical activity, what is the diet and also uh, their BMI and with also their contraceptive requirements and think of managing their menopausal symptoms vulvar vaginal atrophy, sexual dysfunction, and osteoporosis prevention by giving menopausal hormone therapy. So when do we use it? This is my last slide. And in this one slide, I will explain to you what, when do we use menopausal hormonal therapy and when do we not? You have to individualize the benefit and the risk. Patients with hypogonadism and premature ovarian insufficiency, yes, you need to give it. Treatment of symptomatic women who are less than 60 within 10 years of their menopause, you need to give. To, for prevention of osteoporosis, when women are less than 60 and within 10 years of their menopause, you need to give. For treatment of depression 
or cognitive benefits you should not give for primary protection against cardiovascular dis disease should not give for metabolic benefits should not be given for the high risk of breast or ovarian cancer cardiovascular disease or thromboembolism you should not give so these are the important uh, issues uh, where you need to give menopausal hormone therapy and midlife is the life when we have to be aware and treat patients who require this therapy thank you very much